Thank you. You may be seated. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Now in heaven exalted high. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Please take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, back to that portion of text that we read just a moment ago in the book of Exodus. We're in Exodus chapter 9. We're looking at verses 8 through 12. The message today is entitled, Boiling Mad Magicians. Now, what we've studied so far is the plague of blood, the plague of frogs, the plague of lice, the plague of flies, and the plague of murrain, which is a cattle plague. It may have been mad cow disease for all we know. We don't know exactly what kind of a plague it was, but it was killing all the domesticated livestock throughout the land of Egypt. As we review that very quickly, and it's important that we do a little bit of review because it helps us to understand a switch in gears that is taking place as we move into the plague of boils today. Now, it's called a pestilence in other places, and we'll notice that pestilences show up in some of our future messages as well. But we need to remember that not just the very last plague, which was the plague of death, caused death for human beings. As we've been going through this series, and as the plagues are intensifying, people are beginning to die along with animals dying in these plagues. The most severe one, of course, is the plague of death for the firstborn that killed people exclusively, but other people were dying in the other plagues as well. Last week we closed off with looking at the order of the plagues that God poured on Egypt. <clears throat> After the plague of flies, God sent the murrain, this pestilence on the horses and cattle and donkey and so on. And we noticed that in that plague, God began to move against the economic structure of Egypt because the God of wealth and prosperity was the God that God was judging in Egypt. The God of wealth and prosperity. And so he hit what was really the thing that was most valuable to them that their entire economy depended on. I think that God may be doing the same thing here in the United States, or at least warming up to do that same kind of thing. And as God always does, God blinded the minds of those that believe not. We learned a very important principle found throughout the Bible, that there are always at least two possible explanations for every event in history. Either the events are supernatural, or the events are natural. Everybody sees the same amount of evidence, but then they have to make an explanation as to whether or not they think it is natural or supernatural in its origin. If they decide it's supernatural, they also have two further possible choices. Either it's from the God of the Bible or it's from the devil and those who are under his control, the demonic forces. And we gave many different examples of this from the Bible during the last two messages. The most obvious illustration of this we pointed out today is the war over evolution. The exact same evidence of this complex world of nature is visible to everybody. It doesn't matter whether they're an animist or a PhD scientist, whether they're a Hindu, a Muslim, a Buddhist, a secularist, or a Christian, the same evidence is available to all of them. Some realize it's supernatural, but then they make the wrong decision like the Pharisees did, and they ascribe the world to pagan demonic gods. Some reject the supernatural entirely, and they explain everything in terms of natural causes, which are obviously the most obvious of the evolutionists. Compromising Christians try to blend the natural and supernatural explanations so they'll be accepted by the militant atheists, and thus they steal glory from God like the theistic evolutionists do. A man must willfully reject God in spite of the evidence. But God always lets there be a way open to hell for the man who insists on rejecting him, just like God always gives a possible naturalistic explanation for his work in the world around us. That dual possible explanation is also present as we're studying the ten plagues. 
The naturalist looks at the plagues and says, oh yes, the logical order of the plagues is that one plague caused another plague. It was all by natural causes, and so no supernatural intervention is necessary. And then they go on in their blind unbelief and ultimately end up facing the God who made all things. We saw that the Apostle Paul explains this phenomenon as a judgmental blindness. He says it's a judgment from God, the blindness that they have. Jesus also said the same thing, that it's a judgmental blindness in John chapter 9 when he healed the man born blind. John 9, 39, Jesus said, For judgment I am come into this world, that they which see not might see, and that they which see might be made blind judgmental blindness. We looked at the names of the Egyptians' gods who theoretically controlled all the elements that God was judging. The plague of blood against Osiris, the god of the Nile, the, the life source, the creator source. Uh, the plague of frogs against Hec, the frog goddess. And we talked about and gave illustrations of frogs who are still worshipped, the demons behind them all around the world today. The plague of lice, that was against the god Set, the earth god, since lice were actually created out of the dust. The plague of swarms, that's the flies and the scarab beetles smashed underfoot against Hatcock, the wife of Osiris. The plague of the cattle disease against Apis, the sacred bull god. That's against their economic wealth. And we talked about how that picture is still seen today in the so-called bull markets and bear markets. The economic wealth of Egypt. Today we're going to look at the plague of boils against the false god Typhon. We're going to look then at the plague of hail and fire against Shu, the god of the atmosphere. The plague of the locusts against Serapia, the god who protected Egypt against locusts. And then the plague of darkness against Ra, the sun god. And the plague of the firstborn against all the gods of Egypt whom they worship to keep alive. Every one of those judgments is on one of the principal gods of Egypt. And we learned a lesson from that. I think an important lesson as we look at the progression of the plagues going through. God uses little things first in our lives to get attention. Things like the blood, the frogs, the lice, and the flies. Before he sends the really big times of chastening and judgment. It's those little reminders that are really an extension of the grace of God, even though they can hurt. Because he's getting our attention that he's there. When he sends those small things into our lives. But then God protects his own people from very specific judgments. Beginning with that plague of flies, we saw that God separated out the land of Goshen. He separated the land of Goshen from experiencing the plague of Murain against the cattle. Genesis chapter, I mean, Exodus 9, 6, the Lord did that thing on the morrow, and all the cattle of Egypt died, but of the cattle of the children of Israel died not one. We saw in that last message also that God established another principle that we can always rely on. And that principle is, God never changes his message. Remember that. All, all the doctrines of the pagans and all the gods of the pagans are always giving these new revelations that everything is always changing. You can't really be quite sure whether you can depend on them or not. God never changes his message. The Lord said unto Moses, Go in unto Pharaoh and tell him, Thus saith the Lord, God of the Hebrews, Let my people go that they may serve me. Same message except it's getting a little bit louder now in Pharaoh's ears. We serve a God who never changes. That's the doctrine of the immutability of God. We looked at many passages, but just a few for reminder. Malachi 3, 6, For I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. James 1, 16 and 17, do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good and perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness nor shadow of turning. God doesn't change. Remember, God is immutable, but he's not immobile. When he appears to change to us, it's because it's reflecting his absolute character in relation to what he sees in man. Since God always pursues a righteous course, Therefore, his attitude replies to every moral change in man. The second major lesson that we learned from these plagues about the immutability of God is this. <clears throat> if God tells you to do something, he is going to break you until you do it. 
His rod gets more severe and more severe until you obey. Pharaoh had to learn that, of course, the hard way, and some of us have had to learn those things the hard way. But Pharaoh was not among God's elect, and so he was crushed. The Bible tells us he was not among God's elect. Romans chapter 9, verse 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will, he hardeneth. You know that verse that I just read out of Romans 9.17 is actually a quotation from Exodus. In fact, it's a quotation from the very next plague in our list here, the plague of hail. Very interesting, Exodus 9.16. Here is what Paul quotes. Paul is going back to the plagues in the book of Romans chapter 9. And in very deed for this cause have I raised thee up, for to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. The Apostle Paul thought that the plagues were important to stick in perhaps the key doctrinal epistle of the entire New Testament to remind us of the way God is, his character, his nature, his actions, his attitudes, his purposes. He takes us back to the plagues. You know, Pharaoh is, is used as an illustration throughout Scripture, and so is the land of Egypt. Pharaoh is consistently used in Scripture as an illustration, a type or a picture of two things. The first thing that he is a good illustration of is the non-elect degenerates who are in rebellion against God. And he's used that way. He is referred to throughout Scripture that way as, the, as, as one of these non-elect degenerates who are in rebellion against God. But the second way in which Pharaoh is portrayed in Scripture is he is a picture of Satan. Very similar to Ezekiel chapter 28, where there is the king of Tyre and the prince of Tyre. And the prince of Tyre is under the control of the king of Tyre, who very clearly in that passage is Satan. Pharaoh is given as a picture of Satan. And then the nation Egypt is consistently used in scripture as an illustration or a type or a picture of the world under the control of Satan and degenerate rulers. Very interesting. So as you, as you think about Satan and Egypt, realize that God uses that just like he did with Mount Sinai, which he talks about the law and then its relationship to Hagar over in the book of Galatians, and then the city of Jerusalem in its comparison with Sarah, the true wife, and the promises that were given to Abraham. God likes to use pictures because it's almost like he's teaching little children, and indeed we're supposed to be teaching our children, and pictures help them understand theological truth. So remember that when you're thinking about Pharaoh and when you're thinking about Egypt. But you know God doesn't just judge the wicked, God also chastens his own children. However, there's a difference, and I hope you picked that up last week. There's a difference between judgment and chastening. Judgment is destructive. Chastening is beneficial. And chastening is done not in wrath, but in love. God chastens us in love to correct us so that he can bring his blessings to us. Hebrews 12, 6, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourges every son whom he receives. <clears throat> so, Back to what we were looking at, the fifth plague of cattle murane was a judgment on the economic wealth of Egypt. Money and material possessions have always been one of the principal false gods in every society. In the Middle Eastern culture, of course, as we talked about it in ancient times, the wealth was in their domesticated animals. They were not only necessary for food to eat, but they were necessary for all the labor of the field. They didn't have tractors and combines and trucks to carry the harvest to market. The bulk of the labor was done by horses and donkey, donkeys and oxen and camels. And we compared that with today last week, the information age in which we live. That's how wealth is transferred today. You know, you go down to a store and what do you have in your pocket? Do you have a credit card or you have a debit card? Your money is in the bank. Or at least there's a number in the bank that shows that you theoretically have some money at the bank. But if there was a run on the banks, then a bank that's having a run on it immediately appeals to the Federal Reserve Bank. So Federal Reserve Bank, which is right across the river from us in Philadelphia, packs a bunch of bags of money, runs them in a truck across to that bank where there's this run going on the bank. And theoretically, uh, it'll be able to stop any of these runs on the banks. 
problem is the banks take your money and they loan it out they don't just keep it stored there they loan it at interest so they can make money and the federal reserve bank does the same kind of thing and so if there was a run on every bank in the united states every bank would run out of money and so would the federal reserve but you know where your money is as far as they're concerned is just a number on their computer there are all these little digital numbers up there in their big mother computer somewhere that shows where all the money is going it's an information age that's where your money is and you know that can be wiped out instantaneously that's why people are worried about the EMPs that we talked about last year last month electromagnetic pulse bombs that would wipe out all the computers and equipment that relies on electricity by taking down the power grid in the US and it would wipe out all of your electronically stored financial data it would eliminate your bank account that could make you a helpless pauper overnight even if you had millions of dollars stashed away you thought in the bank people that's the age we live in that's where our wealth is our human wealth it could wipe out all the systems of automobiles trucks tractors boats airplanes motorized vehicles you won't be able to get to your destination unless you can walk to your destination you say well the grocery store is closed I'll be able to walk to the grocery store and get food oh no forget it the grocery store you rely on won't have any food because there'll be no way to transport food to the store in fact there'll be no way to manufacture the raw food into food products to get it from the farms to the plants where it's produced do you understand they were didn't get it do you understand how fragile we are when standing before a holy God who controls everything Pharaoh kept hardening his heart when that happens and it will the world will enter a time of panic and fear and chaos because it's prophesied that way in the book of Revelation there will be widespread rioting vandalism looting stealing from people breaking into your houses and into your homes to see if they can find anything that they need and that will be the perfect vacuum for the Antichrist to step in and fill as he brings martial law and order in society the world world will gladly worship him they will worship him the Bible says so because he is able to bring order to the chaos and restore their economic systems remember if you don't have the mark of the beast you can't buy or sell that's economic system that we're talking about not merely worshiping him you can't buy or sell your people our world is set for this we are living in the last times the United States is not a big big player on the on the screen of prophetic history this could happen within our lifetime I suspect it will a lot is being said about the economy in the United States because in the United States for most people money is their God oh they don't have a little statue that they worship and say this is the God of money but uh, but they've got their checkbooks their bank accounts their online statements the stuff that comes to them in the mail money is their God money material things in fact perhaps the primary competitor against the true God in America today so just like he did in Egypt do you not think that the true God will utterly destroy that false God that is stealing the hearts and the minds of God's people because you see God clearly states that covetousness is idolatry idolatry is worshiping a false God and God says covetousness all that groveling that we do about our money and our bank accounts and all of our wealth and all the stuff we've amassed and stored up and hoarded covetousness is idolatry Colossians 3 5 mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth fornication uncleanness inordinate affection evil concupiscence and covetousness which is idolatry it's the only one he describes with an additional phrase for which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience just like God's wrath came on the people of Egypt for worshiping that false God in the which ye also walked sometime when ye lived in them God says yes I know that's the way that you used to be but you're a Christian now 
That's the kind of desires you used to have. But you're a Christian now. That was your manner of life back there in the dark ages. But you are a Christian now. And Christians are supposed to be different. You know, it's something if God says something once in the Bible, when he says it twice, we need to pay attention. Did you know he wrote exactly the same thing in Ephesians chapter 5? First one, Colossians 3, 5. Now look at Ephesians 5, 5. For this you know, that no whoremonger, that's pretty bad, nor unclean person, nor covetous man, who is an idolater, now get the last part of this, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Do you want to lose your inheritance? It doesn't say you lose your salvation, but you can lose your inheritance. You can lose your inheritance. You never cease being the genetic son or daughter of your parents. You're always their son or daughter. But you know you can do something that makes them so mad at you that they cut you out of their will. God says here, no whoremonger, nor unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no man deceive you with vain words. People like to play this one down. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. That's the reason God's judging the world. Why should you as a Christian have that characteristic in your life? Be not ye therefore partakers with them. For ye were sometimes darkness. That was back in the dark ages, remember? All of us used to live in the dark ages back when we were unsaved. But now are you light in the Lord? There's a difference between the children of darkness and the children of light. Can you tell the difference when you walk into a room between a room that has no lights on and a room that has the lights on? Can you tell the difference? Everybody who can tell the difference, raise your hand. Okay. We can tell the difference, can't we? The children of darkness used to be there. But now he says to walk as children of light. Ye are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. There's supposed to be a difference between the way in which we as Christians live our lives that's different from the world around us. So the judgment that came on the domesticated animals of Egypt was also a judgment on their war machine. We talked about that, the, the chariot being their most powerful machine. And God saved 600 of horses for 600 chariots so that he could give them one final blow at the crossing of the Red Sea. And by the way, that's parallel to the final crushing blow that God will deal to the combined armies of the world at Armageddon under the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 16. Interesting that we see Three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of devils working miracles which go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather the battle that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And he gathered them together into a place called in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon, the mountain of Megiddo one of the mountains that guarded the pass, the other two, Ibliam and Ta'anak, the pass through the Jezreel plain into that great valley that Napoleon called the greatest battlefield in the world. Satan gathers the armies of the earth together there to fight Christ. And just like Pharaoh, God is going to take their final massive war machine and he is going to destroy it. He's going to crush it. I saw heaven open. Behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. In righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire. On his head were many crowns. He had a name written which no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. That's the prophecy of Psalm 2. And he treaded the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of, his alm of Almighty God. And he had on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God. 
that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses and of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army. They think they're coming to do battle with each other on the plains of Megiddo. But Satan has called them there because he knows the time has come to do battle with the armies of heaven. And as Christ's sign, the Shekinah glory, appears in the heavens, and as he begins to return to earth, the armies of earth focus their attention not on each other, but they focus their attention on him. It's just like the Red Sea. And God closed the sea on all the Egyptians and killed them. That's what he's going to do here. Gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse and against his army, and the beast was taken in the false prophet with him that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone, and the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceedeth out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. The theme for the youth rally is going to be birds in the Bible, or birds in the scriptures, and... Um, a lot of different things about birds and scriptures. Here's something about birds and scriptures. They're going to eat people someday. So it's important to remember that even if certain protective factors are built into an economy to keep the government from collapsing, even if there are certain protective factors built into the military machine with self-buried uh, buried missile silos with nuclear warheads to shield them from an EMP attack, God can still take out the self-reliant military defenses of a nation. Now, some people will challenge and say, you know, we don't really think that this was just directed against the gods of Egypt. Well, God himself said it was. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. When we get to the Passover, the night of the Passover, here's what God says. Exodus 12, 12. I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. Now, listen to the next phrase. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. I'm not guessing that this is against the gods of Egypt. God said so in Exodus 12.12. 12. By the way, from the pen of Jeremiah, God later prophesied another judgment against the gods of Egypt. Jeremiah chapter 43, verse 12. And I will kindle a fire in the houses of the gods of Egypt, and he shall burn them and carry them away captives, and he shall array himself with the land of Egypt as a shepherd putteth on a garment, and he shall go forth from thence in peace. Say, so who's that talking about? Well, in the context of Jeremiah chapters 43 and 44, it's a prophecy to the group of Jews who thought that they could escape Nebuchadnezzar by fleeing back to Egypt from which God had delivered their ancestors. But like the gods of Egypt had not been able to deliver the Egyptians in the days of Moses, the gods of Egypt certainly could not deliver the Jews who fled back to Egypt in the days of Nebuchadnezzar. But he uses that same phrase that God uses in Exodus 12.12. 12. You see, God had already judged the gods of Egypt. The Jews should have remembered the Exodus and known that God never wanted them to go back to Egypt. God never wanted them to go back to Egypt. There's a lesson in that. Trying to go back to the old ways of the world is always a futile and tragic mistake. And you know, death is always the ultimate outcome of deliberate rejection of the will and the word of God. It's never a reason for trying to escape suffering by compromising with pagans and the ways of the world. That's a major lesson of the Bible, and it's here in our text. This is a major lesson that God wanted the Jews to learn from the plagues of Egypt. Did you know Jesus said the same thing? In fact, he said it in four different places. Once in Matthew, once in Mark, and twice in Luke, in two separate chapters, separated by 12 chapters between the two chapters. Listen. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. 
Whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. That's Matthew 16, 25. Mark 8, 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. See, they're trying to save their lives by compromising and going back and walking the ways of the world. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake in the Gospels, the same shall save it. Luke 9, 24. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. Luke 17, 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it, and whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Do you think that when something shows up four times in the Bible that God wants us to learn a lesson? I hope so. Listen to how Paul puts it in the book of Hebrews. Paul repeats that theme. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 26. For if we sin willfully after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law, takes us back there, right across the Red Sea, died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sorer punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done desperate under the Spirit of grace? For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth to me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And now here's the scary phrase. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Dear people, the plagues in Egypt are designed to teach us something. Don't go back to your old ways. The, day, the Jews in the days of Jeremiah wanted to go back to Egypt to avoid the suffering that was coming under the armies of Nebuchadnezzar. God told them not to do it. God never wanted his people to go back to Egypt. Going back is always a temptation that we face related to our old sinful and compromised ways of life. The believers in Jerusalem, when the book of Hebrews was written, wanted to go back to the old temple worship of Judaism to avoid persecution. But God had finished with that system and told them not to do it. Today, application time, believers want to go back to the old ways of the world because it appears to be so much easier and so much more comfortable. But God says, don't do it. You know, it doesn't matter where you find yourself in history. The principle is always the same because God doesn't change. When God has called you out and called you to be separate, never go back to the old ways or you'll find yourself under the heavy and painful hand of God. Jeremiah reminded the Jews to whom he was writing that the gods of Egypt were puny, helpless, and impotent. Those gods could not protect Pharaoh during the plagues, and those gods certainly could not protect the Jews if they fled back to Egypt. The plagues of Egypt were directed against the gods of Egypt, and the Jews should have remembered that the gods of Egypt were utterly helpless. You know somebody else should have learned that lesson? Have you ever thought that the magicians should have learned that lesson? Those are the guys that are getting hit in the text today. The magicians should have learned that lesson. The lesson of not going back is one of the principal lessons the magicians in our text today had to learn. You see, they already knew that they were dealing with a real God, with the real sovereign God back at plague number three. That's when God sent the plague of the lice, and they were not able to duplicate it. Do you remember what they said? Here Moses smites the dust of the earth, and it becomes lice throughout the land of Egypt. And verse 18 says, And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. Verse 19. Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he hearkened not unto them. He didn't even pay attention to his own magicians. But his magicians had gotten the point. His magicians knew where the source was that had produced the lice. It wasn't one of their parlor tricks. It wasn't one of the little demon tricks. Only the sovereign living God of the universe could do this. They knew it. 
But even though the magicians knew the truth, they did not want to give up their comfort. They did not want to give up their jobs. A pretty good job if you can be a magician to Pharaoh. They did not want to give up their salaries. They did not want to give up their power. They did not want to give up their perks and their prestige. They knew the truth, but they went back to their old ways after that plague three. They kept on serving Pharaoh. They kept on showing up in court every morning when Moses was there. They kept on trying to counter what Moses was doing. After all, you know, they had a pretty good life serving Pharaoh. They probably figured that Moses would eventually go away. You know, it'll, it'll go away eventually. They saw their boss was tough and refused to do what he was told. So they decided that they would be tough and ignore Moses too. And so when we get to this plague, God had a specific judgment prepared for the magicians. It's only one where, up to this point, where we've seen the magicians themselves are getting hit. It was not really a judgment against Egypt and the gods of Egypt. It was against the magician. Did you see that in the text? Verse 9 says, And it shall become small dust in all the land of Egypt, these ashes that are being thrown up. They took the ashes, they threw them up. Blames were upon both man and beast. And then verse 11. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. God was making a point to the magicians. Guys, I gave you warning. You knew it was me by the time we got to plague number three. Now, here we are. And you've had three more plagues. And you haven't quit your jobs. You've seen each of these plagues getting worse and worse. And are you stupidly still hanging on? You know, it's almost humorous, the parallels that we see with plague number three and why God smacked the magicians in the head of this plague of boils. Moses started with ashes from a furnace, which, by the way, is a reminder of hell that is coming for those who reject the word of God. Very interesting. From a furnace. There was a smoking furnace in the book of Genesis that walked between the pieces where the covenant was cut with Abraham. Wish we had time to talk about furnaces in the Bible. Gives you the picture of hell. Here Moses would take ashes from a furnace. But when he sprinkled it toward heaven, while Pharaoh was watching, did you notice that? It said while Pharaoh was watching this, it turned into small dust. God said it would in verse 9. It should become small dust in all the land of Egypt. It turned into small dust. You remember what was said about the plague of lice? Exodus 8, the Lord said unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land. Verse 17, All the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. Dust. You know, the dust of the earth became lice, like the dust from the ashes became boils. Second, did you notice the plague of lice? The lice were on both man and beast. That was both in that plague of the lice and also in this plague of the boils. Chapter 8, verse 7, Aaron stretched out his hand with his rod, smote the dust of the earth. It became lice in man and beast. In the same way, we see man and beast here, the double whammy for the animals in Exodus 9, 10. He took the ashes of the furnace, stood before Pharaoh. Moses sprinkled it up toward heaven. It became a boil breaking forth with blains um, upon man and upon beast. That's blisters. Blains are blisters. Third, did you notice that in the plague of boils, God did not use either the rod of Aaron or the rod of Moses. Looking at the details makes this very fascinating when you compare the plagues, how God did it. In the plague of lice, God used the rod of Aaron. Not the rod of Moses, but the rod of Aaron. It says so specifically. But in the plague of the boils, God used the hand of Moses. God wanted to make it perfectly clear to Pharaoh and the magicians that this was not a magic rod. On occasion, God may use an instrumentality like the rod. But on other occasions, God may work directly through a man, and that's a very important lesson, how God works through people. Fourth, the magicians had continued to stand with Pharaoh when God hit Egypt with the plague of the lice. They should have learned their lesson and taken early retirement at that point. But instead, they kept holding on to their jobs. So God said, I'll make sure that you leave work early today. Are you holding on to a compromising job that violates the word of God? but you really don't want to leave because the pay is so good or because the perks are so fantastic 
or wait till you see my retirement plan. And the magicians could not stand before Moses because of the boils, for the boil was upon the magicians and upon all the Egyptians. God specifically mentions how this plague affected the magicians because it parallels the dust of the plague of lice where they learned the truth, but where they rejected the truth. Apparently God didn't hit Pharaoh himself personally with this plague because Pharaoh immediately hardened his heart. Pharaoh didn't care about the animals. He didn't care about the people of Egypt. He didn't care about the magicians, although they continued to serve him. There's a lesson in this. Just remember, it doesn't pay to serve the devil. The devil never cares about his own people. Fifth, here again we have a judgment directly against these magicians who obeyed Satan and his agents. The devil and his demons have the ability to strike men with painful boils that fester and burst, as we've learned in the book of Job. So the very God that they worshipped was used in judgment against them. Job 2.7 So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord and smote Job with sore boils from the sole of his foot unto his crown. There wasn't one square inch on Job's body that didn't have these huge, painful boils and blisters that were breaking open. And as you read Job chapter 2, it says Job sat down where? <laughs> Verse 8 He took him a potsherd to scrape himself with all, and he sat down among the ashes. Ashes, ashes, boils, devil, judgment, gods of Egypt. You begin to connect the dots. Do you see what God is doing here? These magicians who are worshiping the devil, God uses the devil and one of his most painful ways of hurting a person through the boils. What a different response Job had, though, compared to the same affliction that hit the magicians. At the end of that passage, I didn't read it for you because it's fairly long and our time is out, but let me just read you a couple of verses. His wife said unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. What a different response compared to the same affliction that hit the magicians. And what a different response Job had from the way that Pharaoh hardened his heart. You see, having the same affliction merely showed what was already in the heart. And when you as a believer have the same affliction that somebody in the world has, maybe heart problems, maybe cancer problems, maybe liver problems, maybe kidney problems, maybe some kind of a tumor in the brain, maybe whatever it is, What's in the heart will be shown by the way in which we respond to those problems versus the way in which the world responds to those problems. God can read the heart, but Satan cannot. Apparently, Satan thought that covering Job with boils was the very most painful thing that he could do to get Job to curse God. Satan could have hit him with cancer or some other horrible disease, but when he had the opportunity, what did the devil choose? He chose the boils that would affect every nerve ending in Job's body. We don't have time for it today, but certain types of leprosy were also identified by boils in the book of Leviticus. And again, as we saw last week, there comes a time when God clearly separates his people from the judgments that will come on the world. It's called the rapture. And in the text today, it says the boils were specifically on the magicians and the Egyptians, not on the Jews. In the natural realm, disease vectors don't make their selections on the basis of race. Only the magicians and the Egyptians are mentioned as getting the boils in verse 11. In the book of Revelation, we see that God will also send a painful burning and blistering of the skin on those who turn to curse him instead of repenting. Revelation 16, 8 and 9. The fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues. And they repented not to give him the glory. A lot of parallels between what's going on in Exodus and what's going on in Revelation. The way that affects men and the way that back then, the way that affects men in the future. We have a God who will judge the earth. Now, I hope by the time we're through, you'll be able to list all ten plagues in order from memory. What do we have so far? We've got blood and frogs and lice and flies and murrain. That's the cattle plague and boils. So I've come up with what they used to call in seminary a boudac. 
What in the world is a BUDAC? A BUDAC is where you take the first part of different words that you're trying to remember because it reminds you of an entire paragraph when you are trying to remember a list of things. And you put that together, and the first one begins with a B, and then the next one begins with an O, the next one begins with an O, and then a D, and then an A, and then a K, and that's BUDAC, you know? Okay, well, here we have a BUDAC to help you remember these plagues. First two were blood and frog, so that's blo blow fro. First part is blow fro. Then lice and flies, that's lie fly. And then murrain and boils, well, murrain, you want that murrain, so it's moo, like cattle, and bow for boils, so moo bow, okay? <laughs> blow fro, lie fr fly, moo bow. That's a good tongue twister. If you can remember that, you can remember the first six plagues, and you can remember them in order. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for the privilege of being here today. What serious lessons you teach us as we go through the plagues. This is not a happy portion of scripture. This is not one designed to give us the warm fuzzies and tickle behind our ears. It's designed to remind us that there is a God in heaven who judges sin. A God in heaven who tells his people not to go back to the old ways of the world. But a God who delivers his people when they obey him. A God who tenderly leads them like a shepherd through the wilderness. A God who ultimately brings them into the promised land. Father, we thank you that you are such a God and that you are a God who loves us and you proved it by giving your son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place on Calvary. We come to remember that right now. What wondrous love is this, O oh my soul? that the Lord of bliss should come down from heaven and rescue me. Father, as we come to the Lord's table today, we pray that you cause each one of us to be in right relationship with you. That you'll bring to our minds the sin that is there. But we've done this past week or since the last time we've had the Lord's table together and cause us to confess it, to truly repent from it. For you have promised in your word, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, Father, we come before your table this day, thanking you for the gift of eternal life and for the one who died in our place that we might live. In Jesus' name, amen. In preparation for the Lord's table, let's take our hymnals.